think okay we should, should we should be good now okay all right ready to roll i think so uh-huh. let's do this let's do this <laughs> Welcome to Wood Talk for woodworkers by woodworkers. Now, here are three guys who have great personalities Mark, Matt, and Shannon. All right, welcome to Wood Talk number 151 for September 30th, 2013. On today's show, we're talking about the golden ratio, the router plane versus the shoulder plane for tenon cheeks and mobile bases. But before we get to all that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Today's show is supported by Festool. Helping woodworkers get better results in less time and with less mess to clean up afterwards. Visit them online at festoolusa.com. There you go. All right, so last week we had a couple of announcements, just some uh, changes and news. And in the excitement of mentioning the YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash user slash woodtalkshow, I forgot. Oh, that's so easy to remember. Isn't it, though? It's so convenient. It just rolls off the tongue. (laughs) Yeah. What was that again? uh, That would be www. Oh, I'm sorry. H T T P. All right. <laughs> anyway, link is in the show notes. And uh, I forgot to mention that we're doing the show on Mondays from now on. We, we had to circumvent some scheduling issues the last couple of weeks. And as uh, to do that, we just started recording on Mondays, but we held the show till Wednesday. And if you listen to the podcast, you might not realize that. <laughs> when we just didn't realize that we were enjoying this Monday thing, it works a little bit better for the three of us. So we are from now on going to be recording on Monday evenings uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern and 3 p.m. my time or possibly 4 p.m. depending on the time of year. Anyway, 6 p.m. <laughs> Eastern. <laughs> Although sure. I got to tell you, I was sitting at my desk and my wife called and said, uh, don't you have a show tonight? <laughs> it's immediately by, see you, bye. <laughs> yeah, I actually forgot last week. I, I fortunately did not forget this week. It's a little tough to get used to. But <laughs> ultimately, Monday, I think our brains are a little bit more active. And as long as we remember to do the show, it shouldn't come out fairly well. <laughs> right. This is the one day of the week that I am still uh, have all the advantages of having gotten sleep over the weekend. By tomorrow, (laughs) my brain is mush, and I'm happy that I remember my name. Totally, totally. Um, Now, we also mentioned last week, and we'll mention it again, that Wood Talk, I'm sorry, Woodworking in America is coming up, and we are having our little meetup on October 19th. So if you're in the area or you're going to the show, you got to stop by around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. at the Keystone Bar and Grill in Covington, Kentucky, and we hope to see you there because it's going to be awesome. Right. Absolutely. Bring bail money just in case. (laughs) You never know. (laughs) Never know. Uh, And I I would imagine, I would hope that the guys from uh, Modern Woodworkers Association will be there to hang out too. I mean, it's it's not formally a joint meetup, but I hope those guys and their crew will also be there. So... Absolutely. They seem to think there was there was some talk of that, but that was months ago, so I don't want to hold them to it. Yeah, I mean, they might have other plans. I mean, they're very important people, so <laughs> they have other things going on. Um, all right, let's move into what's on the bench. I'll go first. So I've been researching humidors, and as a non-smoker, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I meant to ask you that the other day. It's like... I've uh, honestly, uh, I've, I've never smoked anything other than maybe like noobs in modern warfare. <laughs> I... <laughs> I don't, it's just not something I've ever been into and I don't do, I don't smoke cigars. So I am researching this purely from an academic perspective on what, what makes a good humidor, what keeps the flavor and enhances the flavor of a cigar and keeps the humidity where it needs to be. And uh, it is interesting. I mean, it's uh, clearly, it comes down to materials and good tight joinery and keeping that moisture in there, but it's still just a box ultimately. So um, it's a very interesting thing to read about and how, Uh, You know, there's things that I geek out outside of the woodworking world, and this is one of those where you see these people who are so into this whole humidor thing um, and perfecting their humidors. It's just a whole different area, a little subculture of woodworking in the the world of cigar smoking. It's pretty cool. Subculture is a good way to put it because I get get calls all day long from these guys Mm because I've – <clears throat> Put it this way, I'm really well ranked on Google for Spanish cedar. <laughs> so I get phone calls and emails all day. Um, we uh, the, the McIlvain website's like all over the puff.com forum. Mm-hmm. For those in the know, that's a big forum for cigar smokers. Nice. And uh, you're, you're right. These folks are, I mean, some of these things are absolutely works of art. But they're engineering marvels at the same time. It's yeah. really cool stuff. Well, ultimately, you're, you've got this major challenge of a high humidity chamber inside the box. And then, of course, the outside conditions that are somewhat variable inside a house or an office or whatever. And your goal is to keep it at a steady 
um, a, a steady humidity and you have to have, there's a, of course you have the hygrometer inside to give you an idea of what the humidity is. And then you have something that actually keeps it humid uh, and you have that usually on the inside of the lid or on the back or something like that. So trying to get this thing to be stable and make sure it doesn't move over time and it's not leaking a bunch of uh, humidity into the environment. So you have to constantly replenish. I don't even know what these things are called, but the little humidity thingamabobber. Um, oh, yeah. The I, little sponge yeah, inside the, little, the, the box. The sponge dealy. <laughs> um, you know, so there's actually, this is one of those things. As woodworkers, we usually plan for general environmental changes. But here's a situation where the environment is still changing on the outside, but the inside is uh, it's staying still. It's at, at one level of humidity, but it's high, very high humidity. So <laughs> it's like it's just a weird challenge. Um, but it, I think it's going to be a fun project to do. So we'll see how that goes. I always keep thinking about uh, when I used to go over to the guys at Tool Select, the one floor down from them was a cigar bar. Like mm. the, It's actually a cigar club, and they had a, a big pane of glass window where as you're walking up the steps, you'd see them in there with their brandy and their nice leather chairs, <laughs> and the whole room just off of that was one giant humidor, and you would see them in there, and it's amazing. It, I think that looked more like a clean room from, say, the CDC than yeah. anything else. I mean, it was airtight. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. So I will uh, keep you guys posted on that, but how about you, Matt? Well, the big thing for me is I am finally moving on to the actual platform bed that I mentioned I was going to be building on the last episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first part I'm doing is what I am lovingly called the undercarriage, which more or less is, is the supports for the slats that will be used to uh, hold the, the bed in place. And this is all secondary wood. It's all not really going to be seen, preferably. Mm -hmm. So I'm having a little fun with that, although I did discover that some of the poplar that I had sitting up on, on a shelf uh, – I must have had a, a sink leak at one point because it was slightly stained. It's completely dry, so I'm not worried about any type of, you know, fungus or anything on it. I mean, there was no m visible mold. It didn't smell really funny other than maybe the very top. Once I planed it, mm -hmm. the discoloration went completely away. But that topmost board, I had a feeling as I was milling it, it probably was going to, like, kind of maybe bow and twist on me because it just had that had that funny feel like every time i took a layer off it almost felt like a spring like a doing and it would just like pop back up into you know the little twist or something so right, right. I, I should have known better than to keep on going but i did it anyways and so now i have these two pieces that uh look nicely milled but i swear the second they came off the uh planer they literally just started like potato chipping right in front of me oh geez that's <laughs> so nice. So you they can were the sacrificial the wood one. moving. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the, the darndest thing. But again, that, those were the ones that were right on top. So apparently, having that one sacrificial board saved the rest of the pile for me. So I was kind of happy about that. But at the same time, I'm like, this just sounds like something out of some weird, you know, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Like, watch the twisting board in front of you. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it's amazing twisto. But. The other thing that we ended up doing this weekend is in Grand Rapids, uh, there is a big thing going on called Our Prize, and I've been doing this for a few years, and it's all sorts of amazing things, and I've never had a chance to go down there. My family, all three of them have gone down, and they brag about it, and I said, well, let's go down Sunday and check it out, and it was a lot of fun because it was the big day that the, the big winners were being announced, and there's a really nice cash prize available for the artists. But part of it was being held at the Grand Rapids Art Museum, and they have a little tiny section that is all about uh, some of the, the big influential furniture builders that were in Grand Rapids. Because at one point, Grand Rapids was like Furniture City USA is what they kind of claimed. It's funny how that moves all over the country now. <laughs> but they had um, several pieces in there, and the big ones were, of course, I'm having a hard time remembering that it, it's Charles Limbert. I keep referring to him as Amber Adam Lambert, and so <laughs> the people at the museum difference. really were not very happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> nice, he has a great voice. Yeah, and he made some really nice furniture too. <laughs> sure. So, anyways, they had a, a couple of original Lambert pieces there. There was a couple of Frank Lloyd Wrights. Uh, they had some original Ames chairs. All that kind of fun stuff. And it was funny because as I was pointing these out to the kids and saying, well, look, at this was made then and they did this, this and this. And I easily, once again, I was reminded furniture is not cool amongst my youngsters. Oh, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> so that was that was the the biggie for for me. Now, now, Shannon, I see you're having precision issues. <laughs> you, this is something you really want to kind of get into. We could, we could do it right here. We can have an intervention if necessary. If precision is something that you're really struggling with. No, it's one of those things where <clears throat> I'm uncovering the the difference between the world of SketchUp 
and the world of reality. Mm. And when I designed um, my treadle lathe, I, um, I built in quite a few bearings, a few modern bearings, to the point where um, every point where the spindle or the crank arm or the axle that is intersects the wood, there's generally at least two bearings you know, that flank either side of that piece. So when the crank arm goes into the, the post, it meets a bearing, and when it exits the post, it meets a bearing. Well, that's like a lot of bearings. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I got them all inlaid, and I, I went to just in, enormous amounts of tweaking to get everything perfectly aligned. And it's one of those things where you make a, in order to make a tweak, you have to completely disassemble the lathe, um, pull the rails off, which are bolted into place, and then you put it down, and you make like one pass with a chisel, and then you put it all back together, and you have to tighten it down. You know, the same reason you don't like flatten the plane sole when the blade's not in there because it puts it under tension. Mm-hmm. And and it's because the precision is such, I had to make sure that it was in the actual conditions it would be when I'll be turning on it. So it went back and forth, back and forth. I spent about six hours tweaking this. And then it suddenly occurred to me, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I don't need all these bearings, you know, because all it's going to take is me to bump this lathe or the humidity to spike in my shop and all of those bearings are going to be ever so slightly out of alignment. Mm. You know, and you, you, the bearings themselves are inherently, they're not um, meant to be, um, uh, what's it called, interference fit bearings where they kind of meld into one one thing. You can get the tiniest little bit of wiggle room between the shaft and the, and the inner diameter of the bearing. And it's, it's good because it allows that little bit of slop. But when you, instead of just having two bearings, when you suddenly have four and six bearings, now everything's got to come to alignment, and it was binding a little bit. And I got it to the point where it was running smoothly, and then I was just like, the minute I take this apart, because I had to take it apart one more time um, to to do the crank arm, and then I would have to take it apart when I do all the jaw boring and all that stuff. I was like, I'm going to have to do this all over again. So I ditched like six bearings in my design, and I went with one bearing at the headstock and one bearing <laughs> on the other end of the headstock, and surprise, surprise, it works great. Everything lines up, no binding issues. And it was just it was just one of those moments where it was like, why am I so stupid? Why am I trying to make my job so freaking hard by like adding in all this precision where it's just not necessary? Yeah, a little over en- those... over engineered a little bit, right? Totally. Totally. I mean, and, and I think it's over engineered is a good word for it, because we talk about overbuilding things. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. one thing. But when you over engineer and like start throwing in, I think what it is is I was trying to apply like the modern engineering of a modern powered lathe to basically a design that Leonardo da Vinci came up with. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, it doesn't work. I mean, and if it does, then it's not going to work in a week. And it was, it was just one of those kind of little light bulb moments. Unfortunately, the light bulb clicked on after I got it aligned, <laughs> <laughs> after I spent, I kid you not, my entire Saturday, you know, I, I, disassembled and reassembled the lathe no fewer than 10 times oh man which is like a five minute process you know each way i was just like you're you're an idiot you're really really kind of stupid so (laughs) sounds like one heck of a learning experience and then to 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 dovetail if you'll into what matt was saying about how furniture is suddenly not cool i was very encouraged uh we had the this was the closing weekend of the stepping stone museum we're closed for the season we have like a christmas event but the wood shop's not open then and um I was splitting a log. We had a huge crowd there because it was a special harvest festival event. And I just needed to split the log to get to something that I could turn on the lathe. And in the, I guess it's been four years that I've been there now. In the four years I've been there, I have never had a crowd so big as when I had when I was splitting a log. Something that I would think be the, the most boring, unexciting thing in the world. But apparently, all it takes to interest people in woodworking is a really big mallet and smacking it on things. So... That's going to be my, my YouTube videos from now on will just be me with a mallet beating the crap out of something. That's Cause apparently you're going to be the pleases. highest rating on there. <laughs> hey everybody, Wait. look, this guy's hitting something made out of wood with something made out of metal. <laughs> and, and I, you know, maybe paraphrase a little bit, but that's basically what you heard the crowd. You hear somebody walk by and you hear some guy go, Hey, check this dude out hitting that log. And, and then like come and they'd sit and they, and, and you know, this is a really, um, disagreeable piece of white oak. There was yeah. no straight grain in this thing at all. So it's not like one of those, like watching Peter Follinsby where it just kind of pops apart. Yeah. Ooh, look how nicely that split. No, it was like six wedges in this like four foot long log and, you know, beating it to within an inch of its life with a 40 pound <laughs> commander, one of those enormous 
timber framing mallets. Mm -hmm. Nice. 30 minutes of this before it finally popped apart and the crowd only got bigger. So we well, you know what they were waiting for is they're waiting for that to bounce right back into your face. That's, <laughs> that's exactly probably what, what they were all like. Come on, one they're more just... whack and that guy's going to get knocked out cold. That's going to be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they were hoping for blood or something. So, you know, anybody who says woodworking is dead, you're not hitting things with a big mallet enough. <laughs> that's that's right. all it is. <laughs> just need to make it more dangerous and uh, exactly. come back in style. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move into what's new. Got a couple of links and things to share with you. Uh, I wanted to bring up very quickly. We're not going to spoil anything here, but for those of you who are Breaking Bad fans, you got a nice visual treatment with um, uh, Jesse building a box, and it was just this little woodworking flashback segment that was really great in the finale. Uh, really just, you don't see that very often in mainstream television, so it was just kind of neat to see it happen. So, great, there's the spoiler. I knew there was something <laughs> big, and that was exactly what yeah. it was. Dang it, Mark, we're only on season two. Oh, I ruined yeah, it. See, that, it's the box he built for the aliens that came down and kidnapped everyone. Oh, sh la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nothing nothing like that, but great woodworking scene. It only lasted for a few seconds, but uh, worth watching. It's always cool to see that in mainstream media. So Sweet. Hey, so... Speaking of things that are, are hip and cool and all that good stuff, Dusty sent a link to something called the Dust Shop, I is, believe is what it is. Is that just or, a coincidence that his name is Dusty? You know, he did mention something about that. There is there's uh, something about the similar name, but he's not getting any <laughs> benefits from promoting them. Okay. But uh, more or less, this is a, a – do you, do you guys ever wear a lot of turtlenecks? When, when you were growing up or even I recently? Did, I did in high school because I went to a Catholic high school and very limited like clothing options. And one of those was a turtleneck. So it just. Okay. And this, did you ever do the thing like where you like pulled it up over your face a little bit? Like, you know, you're kind of like hiding or something. <laughs> like, yes. like when you rob a bank? Yeah. Something like that. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> these, these shirts, actually, th this link will take you to um, basically it's, a, it's, it's some sort of dust protection. It's a, a shirt but it has a little spot that kind of comes up almost like a turtleneck and covers your face. And apparently it has a filter bit built into it. I haven't completely looked at it. I guess it appeared like on the Discovery Channel or something like that. So it's a shirt with a dust mask built into it. It's so in case you guys are looking for something like that. It does look, it looks pretty badass, like in general, but... It, I don't. I don't know. It's kind of weird. It looks hot to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I'm like, I just don't see me wearing that. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends I can on the already material. see my wife rolling her eyes and shaking her head in disgust. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, yeah, the picture Sam that they much have. Did that as soon as I showed it to her. Well, they've got like uh, roadside landscapers and stuff that they're showing in these pictures, and and construction guys. I, I mean, I guess in certain circumstances, I could see it. I don't know that I'd want to wear that in the shop, but um, it might be right for somebody. Maybe in, even in, in colder climates, it might be okay. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Uh, good time. All right, well, we'll put the link in the show notes if you want to go buy your Dusty Shop t-shirt uh, long turtleneck thingy. <laughs> That's nice. It, and, and, and again, Dusty claims that he will not be getting anything out of it. So, oh, look, it's flame resistant. That's good to know, too. <laughs> That's oh, good. very good. That's what we need. Right. We are going to make woodworking more dangerous. So Exactly. <laughs> All right, Shannon, I well, think Well, um... Woodworking America is coming up in what, like three or four weeks? Three weeks, maybe Betty something soon. like that. And uh, it's two weeks away. It's not. Oh, it's two no. weeks from this weekend. Yikes! That's nuts. Okay, then it's a good thing you said that. I would have been really late. I know. I had to look at the calendar and go, "Whoa, wait a minute! I got to start saving up gas money." Oh wait, I've got gas money. <laughs> For me, the marketplace is probably my favorite thing at Woodworking America, and specifically the Hand Tool Olympics is just a blast. It's it's a lot of. Um, kind of healthy trash talk and just, I don't know, it's just a lot of fun. It's it's a great place where you can go, and if you want to take it seriously, you can win cool prizes, or you can just hang out and learn a lot. Um, I know uh, be, getting to dovetail while Frank Klaus dovetailed right next to me was quite a, an experience. You <laughs> learned a lot by osmosis in that. So I'm always a big, always been a big fan, and I've done a bunch of videos in the Hand Tool Olympics, and this year I thought, you know, want to do something different. So um, I reached out to the guys over at Wood Chat, and um, said, hey, do you guys want to do something where we each grab an event and kind of demo it? So this Wednesday night, uh, WoodChat is usually 10 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. my time, or it's because it's hosted by West Coasters. So you West Coasters finally get some respect for a <laughs> 7 p.m. Um, showtime. We, myself, uh, Matt Gradwall, Scott Meek, and Chris Wong – We'll be each taking a couple events and just saying, here's what it is. So for people who've never participated in the Hand Tool Olympics, this is kind of your, your 
primer, if you will, on what you'll be expected to do. And because I think there's been a lot of, I know I've talked to a lot of people who are like, no, I'm not going to compete because I've never ripped a board in my life or anything like that. And <clears throat> it's really not serious. It's really <laughs> not about, I mean, it's not about the time or it's not about, oh, that would be embarrassed to do that. You actually can learn a hell of a lot. If you actually want to learn some things, the guys that run the booth, Mike Seamson in particular, he's a walking encyclopedia of hand tools. He can teach you actually how to cut a tenon or how to cut a dovetail or how to bore a hole straight. Or you can just have a lot of fun. And generally, most of the highlight reels and blooper reels you see from Woodworking in America come from the Hand Tool Olympic booth. So it's, it's just something I want to encourage anybody who goes to participate in. It's definitely not a spectator event. So... That's the idea behind Wood Chat this Wednesday is to maybe get some people to not be scared and to show up and try it. You know, what's a little bit of a confession here. I love the concept of the Hand Tool Olympics, and I encourage everyone to at least stop by because it's it's definitely fun to watch even if you don't participate. But uh, I don't like doing that stuff. <laughs> I, I, I'm, In other words, you don't like being on display. I don't. Like, the weird thing is I don't mind doing demonstrations, talking to groups of people. Clearly, that, that's kind of what I do for a living. But in that situation, I just don't like like all these people watching me while I, I, I hurry and I saw <laughs> a board. It's pressure. It, it is. It is. I really don't like it. And every time I stop by, it's like, come on, Mark, you could do it. And then like the whole peer pressure thing starts and I feel like I'm in high school again. <laughs> oh and God. then I remember that I really don't give an, I don't care enough <laughs> like to, to just like, oh, okay, I'll do this because you asked me to. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I'm, I have a weird, I don't want to call it a phobia, but I, I go back into that like uh, introvert mode in those scenarios and I don't like doing it. It's really weird. No, I, I understand. Believe me, because um, like when I had a, a booth, when the hand tool school had a booth in the marketplace mm -hmm. and it was like Mike Seamson came over, he was like, you know, you're, you're competing, right? There's not a chance in hell I'm letting you out of here without competing. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was a little scary. Cause it was like, I had like my hand tool school polo shirt on and I yeah. walked over and I'm like supposed to be representing this, this school that teaches people hand, hand techniques. And it's like, Oh my God, I have a gap in my dovetail. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, well, and remember I did the video on the 40 minute dovetail right. um, to, com <laughs> to compete with the five minute and the four minute dovetails from uh, Klaus and Kosman. So I am not a speed de demon by any means in any regard with woodworking. So it's like rushing is just not in my vocabulary. <laughs> it's just something right. I don't do. Um, but anyway, enough about that. Uh, who's got the other two links here? Okay, well, these last two, we'll just go ahead and go right through these. They are both, uh, uh, well, actually, one is to a video. A Chris, one of the many Chris's that listened to us, sent us a great video posted by Doug Stowe, and it's called Bump. And I had a chance to do a just a quick drive-through on it before we went on the air. I wanted to see it beforehand, but uh, I didn't. And this is really <laughs> neat. Apparently, it's a family out of Arkansas who are legends in the chair building world and it's just amazing it looks like the patriarch is like 94 and his son who now is I want to say looks like he's in his 50s 60s something like that maybe a little bit older is kind of finally stepping up and wants to kind of do some of the business or at least that's what I took from the five minute zip through of this 12 minute video that I watched but it is all really really neat watching this family build these really cool chairs mm -hmm. So definitely check that out. And then the last one is Glenn. And Glenn said, quote, this guy is one of those woodworkers that makes you feel like you should just cut the cord on your table saw and move on. Amazing stuff. Reminds me of the carvings of silk that you posted a while back. Only you can sit on this stuff. And this is over at the Joseph Walsh studio. And again, I, I headed over there. Check that out. And yes, I have to agree. These are the types of things that it's like, all right, I'm done. That's it. it. I'm it, out of here. Like, I am moving on to knitting. It shouldn't be possible. Right? I mean, like this, yeah, it's stuff he does. It's not fair. No, it's yeah. not. <laughs> Joseph Walsh, stop it. Exactly. Dude. You have no idea what you're doing to generations. I mean, it, it really just looks, it's things that when you look at it and you go, I'm not even sure where to begin. <laughs> right. You know, like, where do I be? Okay, hold on. I know I have to make a template, right? <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's got to be step one. But beyond that, I'm kind of lost. So, well, I like how he even has the the website broken down to like current work and then early work. And yeah. it's like, yeah, please, right. I, I, I don't, don't want to click on that early work. <laughs> His early work is like centuries ahead of anything I could ever possibly dream of doing. Yeah. Like, exactly. Well, well, and the other one that's the to me the most ironic is the one set that says special projects. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that implies that the other ones aren't. 
Because they kind well, those, of those have a flux capacitor built into them. Yeah, amazing, <laughs> Out of, wood, of course, amazing stuff. I would love to see some stuff on this guy's process just to know a little bit more about how it's done. Yeah, but I want to yeah. see him step up to the hand to Olympics. <laughs> well, what I think you should do, Matt, is take one of these pictures of one of these beds he has and show that to Aiden and say, "Do you want that?" Maybe you can get him excited about that. I'll start saving and up your I'll money, kid. <laughs> yeah, gonna buy, uh, there's a guy with several lathes that he's made himself that would be more than happy to take care of this for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, so let's move into our poll of the week by our good buddy Tom Iovino, Tom'sWorkbench.com. You'll see him at Woodworking in America. I, you you probably will hear him. Before you see him. Before yeah, you see yeah, he's, him. He's like a thunderstorm. <laughs> you will hear the thunder long before you see the lightning. That's true. Yeah. Um, all right. And he asked the question, what do you think about biscuit joints? It's like an age old question. Uh, mm. 43% said they're okay, but there are much better options. Uh, 36, I'm sorry, 20% said fast, strong, and easy joinery. Uh, 12% said they're only marginally stronger than a butt joint. 13% said I used to use them a lot, but now I use different joints. Uh, we've had, let's see, I'm losing my place here. 8% said, I don't use quote unquote shortcut joinery. I rely on traditional joints. And only 3% said, they're terrible. I never use them. What about the ones that said something about gravy on them? <laughs> there had to be some of those in there. I mean, they it's did. biscuits. <laughs> yeah, that's what Nicole loves some biscuits and gravy. Mm-mm-mm. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks for that poll, Tom. Um, how about you guys? Have you used biscuits in your work in the past? Uh, sure. Biscuits will be showing up in this project, actually, that I'm working on. But I, I use them more for alignment than anything else. That's mm-hmm. that's my big I, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Did you always though, or were they like the primary joinery at one point? There was a point where they were the primary joinery. Um, yeah, me too. I just <laughs> I just think it's funny how that tool has become like somehow wrong. Well, Norm like we constantly. feel we should be embarrassed because we had one at one point. It's yes. uh, it's the redheaded stepchild of the woodworking. Room. I guess. I mean, that <laughs> was like, that was the thing, man. Like, you got to have a biscuit joiner in order to do this work. I don't know whether it was Norm Abrams' influence or what, but it's just funny how it's so fallen out of favor. Yeah. Right. And you know, and and there are times that I like I like it as a peace of mind to have just some sort of reinforcement. I don't know if it's just purely psychological that somehow, you know, it's like there is something in there grabbing it. And then I see all the forums that are like, it's not doing anything for you. You're just you're just wasting the time and the money. And it's like, mm, yeah, but psychologically I feel better. I think I think if you have if it's used like properly, the alignment is good and it's a fairly t- I mean, you know how sometimes they're a little bit loose. And I mean, certain biscuit joiners don't cut as well as others. So if you have a decent quality joiner and everything fits fairly snug, it's got to help. It's giving you some penetration from one side into the other. It's certainly stronger than a uh, a butt joint. I don't know that it's stronger than, you know, certainly not stronger than an equivalent mortise and tenon joint. Correct. It's certainly better than nothing, you know, And, and I think my very first quote unquote real project was a nightstand and I just followed the plan and the plan recommended biscuit joints for just about everything. Um, I gave that to uh, friends of ours and they still use the thing today. So it's like, it's not like this, this piece of furniture is going to just spontaneously fall apart. Um, (laughs) It it didn't necessarily need the level of joinery that I guess these days that I'm capable of producing that I wasn't capable of doing back then. Uh, It served the purpose for that project and worked great. So see, that's the thing is I think if you have realistic expectations of what that joint's going to do, if you're somehow thinking that you know, whether it be a biscuit joint, a pocket hole joint, whatever the ones that people seem to have these huge, you know, adversions to, uh, it, it's one of those where is it adversion or aversion? Aversion. Aversion. There you go. My version of the aversion. <laughs> uh, but if it's one of those people have the, you know, this aversion to the, the, those type of joinery, it just, they automatically dismiss them. But I personally believe there is a place for it. You just have to be realistic about it. Like I'm not going to use my biscuit joinery to say, uh, have that be the sole, uh, the the sole joinery that's going to make a say forty five degree miter joint work under massive pressure that's just asking for problems. Sure. But if I need it for alignment or just something that's not going to see a lot of pressure on it, you know, I mean, it's not going to be like have an elephant sitting on it or something. Uh, then I'm gonna, I'm going to use it. Sure, makes sense. Not to that me. I have elephants sitting on a lot of my projects. Just by the way, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's contrary to the rumors, Matt. I know. I really got to <laughs> head back to juicing again. I, I just. I, <laughs> No respect anymore. <laughs> okay, let's move into kickback. I'll take the first one because it's my privilege. And Your privilege, yes. Because I'm talking first and no one can stop me. Um, <gasps> first one comes in from Alan. He says, in perhaps the finest Wood Talk episode yet, number 150, you trio. Now, here's the thing. This is like a vocabulary review for me. Have you guys read this? 
<laughs> I, mean, I think we should have Matt read this. Okay, Matt, you go. You do it. Uh, no, it's it's totally your privilege and your right to read it first. Okay. All right. So then I don't even know this word. Demiurges? Works for me. Sure. Okay. You trio of demiurges drolly bantered about lapping hand plane souls. During your amusing discourse, one or more of you mused aloud as to the benefit of the corrugated plane soul. I'm no expert, but my wife and I are currently shopping for vintage planes, and I've been referring referring frequently to the Stanley section of Patrick Leach's Super Tool website where I read the following. The corrugations are provided to overcome that friction, the friction that results between the wood and the soul as the wood becomes true. A very small vacuum forms between the two surfaces. Now he goes on to say, Now, my skills have not yet developed such that my plane grips the board face through the magic of physics. Do you three ever have this problem with your uncorrugated planes? Has plane master Handy O'Shannon ever... <laughs> I like that. Handy O'Shannon. Ever accidentally tossed the board over his shoulder because the smoother evacuated the void between the soul and the wood and refused to let go? If so, my wife and I will enroll forthwith in the hand tool school in order to get to this level. And he gave us the link to uh, the to the part where he read that. So I'll, I'll go first. No, I have never had a vacuum um, between my plane and the wood. Mm, nope, not, not once. And it made me feel like maybe I'm completely missing something. <laughs> so what's the story on that, Shannon? You guys aren't going to believe me, but actually, yes. Yay! All just right. once. You're just trying to get a member to the hand tool school. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, with my Veritas bevel up smoother, it's got that um, <clears throat> 50 degree bevel up blade in it. Yeah, I, I've actually started calling it my polishing plane because it, it. I don't think it takes more than about a half a thou thickness shaving. Mm. Um, on a really, really flat board, I was using maple. So I think it has to probably be like a, a closed yeah, grain, tight, tight grain wood. Um, a diffuse porous wood and um, just for a second the board lifted off I mean we're talking so tiny tiny amount to the point where you guys may have even experienced it Um, yeah so then okay so then it happened the whole point of the corrugation then is that just I don't know what what was the true functionality it seems like a lot of planes were made with the corrugated bottom I never Um, thought about it I mean I was always my understanding was to reduce friction I never thought about it in terms of creating a vacuum to me it was just less surface area running across the wood but that's it's it's true I mean the the fact of the matter is is you got to have that board really damn flat in order yeah. to get that way. I don't think it would be possible. I mean, that that smoother is a short plane, but it's also really, really massive, which I think also puts a lot of weight down. Mm-hmm. Um, I could probably do something like that with like a, you know, a Sauer and Steiner plane or a Ron Breeze plane. That probably happens all the time with those. I think the mass, like just the sheer weight pressing down on the wood may have something to do with it as well. And that's the other thing with that smoother set the way it is, the Veritas I have, you have to put a fair amount of pressure down on it in order for it to work, mm-hmm. which is why it's almost like a polishing plane because it actually kind of burnishes at the same time. So, okay. I mean, the 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 moon has to align with, you know, three of the moons of Jupiter <laughs> in order for it to work. Um, but it actually did happen. And I, I feel kind of bad for saying that because I know it was tongue in cheek, but yes, it's possible. Well, okay, so then if anyone does use corrugated planes and you like it and there's some reason you prefer it or in your work you've actually noticed the difference uh, leading to you having those in the first place, let us know. I'd like to uh, to hear your opinion on that. Definitely. Well, you know, if Ron Brees is there, we should ask him how many times his, you know, he's had people contact him about boards being stuck to the bottom of their planes. Somebody who needs to scale the side of a building or something. <laughs> exactly. I do know that... Um, Conrad Sauer, I have a photograph somewhere in my library of a picture of Carrie Holtman. Uh, let me let me rephrase that. A picture of Carrie Holtman's face reflected in a maple board planed by one of Conrad's planes. Wow. So it's a picture of maple. <laughs> That's awesome. And you can clearly see Carrie's face reflected in it. It's the coolest thing ever. Nice. So if that's possible, then a vacuum is certainly possible. There you go. Sweet. Hey, well, let's move on to this one from Brian. And he says, I recently was listening to the public radio show On the Point with Tom Ashbrook. And they were doing a piece on something I thought might be interesting to fellow woodworkers, especially those considering the jump from amateur to professional. They're discussing. Tell me more, Matt. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you right now. He said, Brian said they were discussing a paid mentoring program run by the website pivotplanet.com, where those looking to move into a new field pay a fee to meet with those already working in it and get a better understanding of what it's really 
what it's really going to be like after making the switch. Now, there, he said at this point, when Brian sent this in, there's one entry from a furniture maker, but I was thinking it might be an interesting idea to put on the, on, on the woodworking community, although I feel like the community might be a little less cash transaction oriented. Uh, is that a curious way of what your thoughts are about a paid mentorship? Is that his way of saying they're cheap? <laughs> um, I think I, he just insulted us all. I, I think so too. Yes, definitely. At least he didn't call us Yankees. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, this this is very interesting. I think it's a valuable thing if it, the quality can be maintained, and mm-hmm. if it's got a built-in like review system where if someone just is, you know, they're 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 pretending to be okay. Let's let's say if they're an Adam King. Uh, for those who remember <laughs> that situation. <laughs> um, wow, that's a flashback right there. Yeah, um, but if there's someone who actually r- truly knows what they're doing and they're truly there to help you understand what you're about to get into, sounds great to me, especially in in the the world of woodworking and furniture building because there's, there's a pretty rude awakening for people who get into this and start to realize how difficult it can be to make a living at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I would be... I'm all for something like this. I think it's a fantastic concept if the quality can be maintained. Right. You know, and, and looking through the list, I mean, obviously, yeah, there's the, the, the whole wood, woodworking thing. But even for those who are in a woodworking business, there's definitely a few other things in here, too, that maybe could branch off into that to kind of help out with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some other things. But, yeah, it's it, it, I think that that is a fine line. And I'm sure you guys run into this once in a while. I mean, you, you don't have something like this, but because of what the paid programs that you do have, there's always that like concern over how, you know, how legitimate is this person? Yeah. Right. You know, but uh, it just, I don't know. I, I, there's a few on here that I'm like, Sam, there's some photography things. Why don't you just, and I'll feed you the answers as you're having the conference. <laughs> well, you know, and that brings up a point. It's almost like, cause I've asked been, I've been asked several times, you know, does this qualify as credits towards such and such certification? And first of all, usually these are people from Europe who ask me this, cause I don't think there's much of those certifications and licenses type things here in the U S yeah. correct me if I'm wrong people, but I, I think just about anybody can be a woodworker or a contractor. You know, you need to have like a, a license for your state, I guess, as a contractor, but um, I get I get that question a lot, and to me it sounds like this is almost just like you know going to school essentially. I mean, you're paying for classes, but in this case, it's more of like shadowing and and maybe possibly helping and yeah, a sort of cool consult consultation kind of situation. There yeah, you but go. The, the cool idea is that you're talking. You would be working with someone who's like actually living the life you hope to be living, right? Um, Because I think the business side of things and like managing your time and all that stuff from a from a furniture maker perspective would probably be the most um, the most valuable thing you would take away. Not you know how to cut dovetails, right? Well, that's looking looking at this particular profile for the one woodworker that's on there is you know some of the things that you can discuss in the various sessions you could have with him are how to have a vision of what you want in your facility and work towards that. Uh, how to organize teams of employees. Wait a minute, I'll have employees. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> how to design furniture uh, manufacturing processes and there's there's a few other ones. So yeah, definitely having that consultation because I think that that's a huge thing. Thing. And I, I think a lot. I think a lot of people want us to do that for them with the show. And I hope that we do at least provide a little bit of information. But I know that we periodically will get questions that are like, um, "I it's really out of my realm." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say we actually do get quite a few that we steer away from um, because yeah. really, not one of the three of us is making a living solely as a furniture maker, and mm-hmm. that is a very different thing than people who make part of their living with a job and part of their living online and, and it's it's a different thing. And the reason I do what I do online or, or the reason I went in that direction was because it was far easier than making furniture for a living. Uh, so the education stuff was, uh, it was more lucrative and easier for me to do. So I don't always feel comfortable giving someone business advice because I went in a totally different direction. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you want my advice? Uh, switch to podcasting. <laughs> right. Which is a whole nother can of worms. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we have one more in here. and let's, let's finish this one off. And this is from Stan. And Stan said, just had the chance to listen to 150. In the discussion of the boiled linseed oil, someone mentioned how hard it can be to try to get the screw tops off of some of the open cans of finishes. Now, I'll pick up a roll of Teflon tape that plumbers use to seal pipes and put a couple of wraps around the threads. It makes it, sh- it, it sure makes it a lot easier to get the top off six months or a year later without having to resort to pliers. Sweet. That's a good tip. I'm going to try that. That is a good tip. Although, I don't know what I'll do with my pliers after that. 
What else will you use them for? <laughs> okay, let's jump into email, guys. Uh, we got, let's see, the first one here is from Kenji. He says, morning, guys. I just recently learned about the Fibonacci golden ratio from Steve Ramsey's blog and wondered if you guys ever use it when designing anything that is rectangular or if you guys just know from experience what the rectangular ratio is pleasing to the eye. This is something I know we've talked about in the past, and I'm going to mention some resources that we've talked about in the past <laughs> right. as well. I'm going to be completely redundant here, um, but I think this is something that can be hammered home periodically so that people don't uh, go too far down a path and drive themselves crazy. Uh, generally speaking, for me, I tend to use things like the golden ratio as a starting point. If, I, if I'm making something that is a rectangle, I may start at the golden ratio and use that as the basis for where I go from that point. Because the thing is, you don't want to lock yourself into these strict numbers because they don't always work. They don't always look the best. It's To me, it's just a starting point. And one of the guys, you've heard us talk about him before, that I am sort of a disciple of is George Walker. I love his his the way he explains whole number ratios. It's something that I understand much better than fractions and decimal places out to you know like <laughs> right, exactly you know to me it's just it's just much more sensible to say that you design things in these ratios so you may even start with something that's like a golden ratio rectangle and then base it off of uh base it off of ratios from that point on um, but really i i love the way they ex he explains that so george walker's blog uh, you could check out at georgewalkerdesign.wordpress.com and you can also look at this new book. We mentioned this probably three or four episodes ago um, by Hand and Eye, which is co-written by George Walker and Jim Tolpin. And I haven't read it yet. It's on my list, but it, it sort of drives home the same point that it may not always be uh, about these magic numbers so much as ratios that tend to make sense for us when we look at them uh, visually make sense. Um, so there you go. Right. Well, don't forget also... Uh we did a nice little review of a George Walker DVD Ooh. where he did kind of go through some of these things. And I agree. It's, it's so much easier when it's something like when you're designing this, use these, uh, the, the compass and mark off two steps with the compass versus take it out to the, uh, 25th <laughs> position of pi and then divide that by 12. <laughs> right. Exactly. Absolutely. And <clears throat> I'll drop a link in there as well. Um, I did a little video from woodworking in America in 2009. In fact, a certain, Matt Vanderlis was sitting right next to me while I filmed it. And this was the Jim Tolpin seminar, I guess, at the design conference where he talks about kind of designing with these whole number ratios. And little trivia fact, George Walker was in the audience with us. And that was, was when George Walker and Jim Tolpin kind of connected for the first time. And the seed for the book that now exists was born. So Th Their eyes go. met and they embraced. Yes, from across a crowded room, the music kicked up. <laughs> it was and, magic. And, and that was it. So I'll... And, and Shannon and I were there to witness the whole thing, and it's it's changed my life. Yeah. Matt kept, like, playing footsby with me, though. It was, you know, that's you what it is. feet are so huge, I didn't have a choice. I was just trying to get up <laughs> on the chair. Sasquatch. Hey. Oh, by the way, you owe me the notes for that still. <laughs> cool. I think I have them somewhere. All right, who's next? Uh, let's see. Where are we here? We, we're doing a show, right? Yeah. I, th I think so. You're next. Uh, okay, that's me. Sorry about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and the part a, of uh... Shannon today is being played by Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was still looking at that uh, Joseph Walsh thing. I was getting lost in his bed designs. So Jim emailed us and he said, I would like to rehash a topic you discussed on episode 137 about planes for cleaning up tenons. To be honest, I was a little bit confused after the discussion. I recently watched The Schwarz on his Mastering Hand Tools DVD, and he uses a router plane to clean up the cheeks of the tenons. A recent article in Woodsmith Magazine uses a shoulder plane to do this. I currently own a bullnose shoulder plane and a block plane, and I don't want to purchase the rabbit block plane you discussed. I'm looking to purchase either a router plane or a large shoulder plane. First, which would work best and be easiest for working tenon cheeks? Second, if I can only buy one, which is the case, which tool would give me the most versatility for other functions? What I find interesting is in this question, he says, you know, I've got a, a bullnose shoulder plane and a block plane. Um, I think what he's saying is because I have those, I don't want to purchase the rabbit block that um, 
I think Mark, you and I both said that, but it's it's more of like, this is the recommendation you get, and I don't want to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he's, that's the way I'm reading this. Yeah, so, I think he's just so basically redundant. When we tooling. originally discussed this, we I think I threw out the router plane, and we talked shoulder plane, and like all of us agreed that the rabbit block plane was the good kind of that was the solution if you were going to buy one plane. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is, I heard what you said, but I don't like it. So <laughs> have you reconsidered again. your thoughts between then and now? <laughs> right. I guess this technically should go in the kickback section. But one of the reasons I wanted to address it is um, Chris uh, Schwartz does use a router plane and shows using a router plane quite a bit to clean up the cheeks of tenons. The only problem I've had with that, and I've, I've done this technique quite a bit, is it doesn't take a very long tenon before you start to have capacity issues with a typical large router plane. Um, the idea is, is you take, you know, you've got your two pieces that are ideally of equal thickness and you set one off the end of the tenon and then the router plane can run over both sides and smooth out the, um, smooth out the tenon. It does require that you have ways to kind of fasten both of those pieces so they're not moving around. And in my experience, if the tenon approaches two inches long, you have trouble. Um, you get to a point where um, the router plane is not as evenly supported on one side or the other, and you can, um, with just a little bit of pressure, take too deep of a cut in one area over the other. So um, that was why I went with a rabbit block plane, just because essentially a large shoulder plane is a great tool for this, and that's what I used for years. But the limitation is, is generally the blade is not wide enough to cover the whole tenon in one pass. And that's where the rabbit block plane is the best solution there. Um, shoulder planes in general are meant to do the shoulders, the ingrain of a tenon, which is why they're generally low angle. So I'm hesitant to say a shoulder plane is really a, the best tool for working tenon cheeks. Um, so I guess if I had to choose between a shoulder plane and a router plane and I was thinking versatility, I would still probably go back to the router plane because it can do more. But it's kind of difficult because what I really recommend is the rabbit block plane, which you said, I don't <laughs> want to buy that one. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Shannon. I've never used a bullnose shoulder plane. What are my disadvantages with a bullnose shoulder plane versus a standard, you know, the standard medium or large shoulder plane? That's a good point. Um, like, can he still yeah. get away with most of those shoulder trimming tasks with the bull nose, which would make buying a shoulder plane, in this case, with his setup, it just wouldn't make any sense, at least to me. Right. But again, I've never knew, used one, so I'm wondering with the, you know, yeah, with the blade I mean, being they, so far up, does that present a problem in some situations? There's not quite as much support. Well, there really isn't support in yeah, front of the blade, hardly so that's there. the only issue. But, you know, if you're using on an ingrain, that's not really a problem. I mean, support in front of the blade is going to cause spelching at the end of an ingrain board anyway. Um, so not having the support is not going to do anything for you. So it's still going to work well, um, you know, for on the shoulders, working the end grain of a tenon. Um, you know, it would work across the, the tenon, um, you know, on the cheek itself. It would work just like, you know, a, a block plane or a router plane. Um, the router plane may get you less of a chance for spelching at the end of the tenon. But I mean, we're talking about a quick swipe with a chisel to kind of chamfer that edge and you won't have that problem. So, you know, in essence, he's already got quite a bit of that capability with his bullnose shoulder plane. Um, now there are a couple of those. So maybe he has one of the thinner ones. So the blade itself isn't very wide, in which case that can be a little bit difficult where it's hard to keep your, your tin and cheek in the same plane because you're having to overlap passes. So that may be, maybe that's the, the, the type of bull nose he has. But mm -hmm. in my experience, most of them are kind of beefy, like on the same thickness as like the large yeah, yeah. Veritas or the large Lee Nielsen Fairly plane wide. or the large Stanley or whatever. Right. So, um, you know, the only reason I'll go with the router plane, I've been long recommending the router plane as like the, the, the primary joinery plane in the hand tool school, just because you can do so much with it. You mm -hmm. know, you can flatten that dado. You can actually make a dado. It's pretty slow to actually make a dado with it. You can do grooves with it. You know, you can adjust your tenon cheeks and such. So um, it is one of those very versatile planes. And considering he already has a shoulder plane and already has a block plane, um, I wouldn't get another shoulder plane. Yeah. Yeah, seems like a no-brainer, I think, now yeah. with the shoulder plane in his possession already. Um, you know, right. the other great thing, we've probably talked about this before, I think the router plane is one of those tools that, especially if you're more familiar with power tools, it's so user-friendly to a power tool-minded person. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're at that fixed depth, you can work both sides of a tenon cheek and you're still completely centered as long as you don't change the adjustment on it. So um, all around, I think it's an incredibly versatile tool and it's very user friendly. Um, what he said. Yeah, what yeah, I said. I'm, exactly. Mark speaking for all three of us. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like that. What else can I say? <laughs> all right. Well, since you're done with that, I'm going to move on to this next question here. You're done, right? Uh, both of you? You finished it? Uh, sure. Okay. I am now. Jeez. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> but back off, buddy. It's my turn. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, this question came in from David, and he's saying, I, I found contractor saws like Rikon and Steel City with built-in mobile bases, but they all appear to come with lower quality parts. Most importantly to me being the fence system, do you have suggestions on mobility if I buy the three horsepower, 30 inch shop Fox table saw that I'm pining over? Am I safe with aftermarket mobile bases? Is there a heavy-duty one you would suggest? And then one more thing before we get to the answer. Uh, David was asking if we could do a shout-out to his father-in-law, Perry, who also listens to the podcast. Uh, so, hey, Perry, this is from your son-in-law, David. <laughs> it turns out he's not as big of a jerk as you guys thought he was. <laughs> I'm just adding that part. I don't really know if that's true. Anyways, though, so... At the heart of this, David is asking about mobility and the mobile bases. Now, uh, the, the original ones that I always think of when it comes to uh, some of the, the built-in ones that are on the saws are those little, like, tripod systems where you have, like, one pivot and then two fixed ones. And uh, I've never really been too crazy about those. Thankfully, there are these aftermarket ones. And <clears throat> let me bring up my, my notes here real quick. You know, one thing, I think you are pretty much safe with the vast majority – of the mobile bases that are out there. One thing I would recommend, of course, is I went and looked at this particular model of table saw that David's talking about, and it's about a 500-pound uh, uh, table saw, if I remember right, 500, 600 pounds. So obviously your big thing is going to be to make sure that you have a mobile base that is rated for 500 or more pounds. And the one that I'm seeing come up quite frequently at Amazon and Woodcraft and a few other places is an HTC model that is for specifically uh, large tools very much like this. The, the big thing for me, whenever I'm looking at a mobile base and a number of tools in my shop are on mobile bases because with a small shop, it's just nice to have that mobility to get them out of the way as needed, is I want to make sure that the locking mechanisms are going to have the tool setting nice and flat on the floor. And I think that's a big part of David's concern is, you know, are they going to roll on me? Nothing to be worse than in the middle of, say, a cut, and you get to that point where you need to add a little extra pressure, and the next thing you know, you're chasing the saw with the wood. That would just be completely uncool. Kind of funny if you caught it on a video, but completely uncool. <laughs> so uh, looking at this particular one that I'm thinking of, uh, just as an example, the HTC HD adjustable mobile base, uh, it has two pivot wheels on the back. It has two fixed in the front. And the nice thing about this is the locking mechanisms for the wheels are actually on the fixed uh, wheels themselves. So it's going to lock those down. And then on the back side, the way that you actually really kind of lock everything down, think of it as like chalking tires on, say, a, an airplane or something, is you have levers that come down and you have the pads that actually engage on the floor. And that's the main thing is to get those, make sure that they're really easy to adjust and that they're easy to engage and you're going to have really great results with it. So uh, to answer your question, David, you can totally uh, uh, feel safe with an aftermarket mobile base. Just, again, make sure it's rated for the size of equipment that you're working with. And then also take a little time, and, and if they have examples out there, play with the locking mechanism. See how easy they are to use and how easy they are to adjust so that you can get them nice and snug on the floor so that you don't have to worry about the tool ever moving on you. There you go. Sweet. I like it. Very nice. Woo. Okay, uh, let's read a couple of iTunes reviews. Well, let's read one because that's all we have time for. <laughs> if you want to leave us from the hundred or so that came in earlier yes exactly if you want to leave us a review in itunes you could look us up in the itunes store click on ratings and reviews and you can ask matt what his wife does while he's podcasting um which is kind of a... tries to like completely interrupt and use up all of the internet access in fact right now i know she's watching the real housewives or something uh, it's a little bit of an inside joke there. Sorry, folks. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to thank, I, I love the spelling of this. The person's name is, you know, you want it, but it's Y-A-N-O-Y-A-W-A-N-I-T. You know, you want it. 
Um, <laughs> Dozer's Workshop and Samantha, speaking of Matt's wife, but not her. Samantha at Avalon Woodworks, who had this to say, through the wind and rain. It's very poetic. Um, she says, I take a walk on the beach once a week, and Mark, Matt, and Shannon are always along to keep me smiling through the wind and the rain. I come back all warmed up, motivated, and inspired to get to work in the shop. I learn something new every week and love to hear Matt occasionally include me in the show. Smiley face. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Sam. <laughs> you know what? If I'm walking on the beach and I got these two guys next to me, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> I was going to say, what she doesn't really know is we actually are there on the <laughs> beach with you. Turn around. <laughs> we're there. It's very scary. <laughs> All right. uh, remember, today's show is sponsored by Festool at FestoolUSA.com. And, you know, people help us out. You guys are great. Uh, we've got a couple uh, donor. That's <laughs> donors. Donor. Donor. <laughs> we have some donors. They're very generous. Oh, um, <laughs> thank you. Oh, oh, my. oh, man. Okay, so we need to thank those donors. Uh, Kevin S., John L., and David from the UK. Thank you guys so much for your support, and thanks for everybody uh, who does the recurring donations. It really adds up and helps us out and pays for the hosting and all that good stuff. So, Matt, how about you give them that contact info, and we'll get out of here. All right, folks. Hey, do you have a comment, a question, or a topic suggestion? You know, there's several different ways to contact us. You can leave us a voicemail. A voicemail on <laughs> Skype. Our username is Wood Talk Online. Call our voicemail line at 623-242-5180. You can email us at woodtalkonline at gmail.com or you can leave us a comment on our Wood Talk Facebook page. Hey, and if you're ever looking for the show notes or downloads from today's show or previous episodes, you're going to find those at woodtalkshow.com. You know what? I have to stop trying to go back through and look for funny things to say during this because <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to work that Demolugio thing that we, we were called earlier. <laughs> oh yeah 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 what is that where is Demur- that demergias something like that I don't demi urges uh, we're showing our lack of education here although all of us went to college so <laughs> i think we probably forgot more than we remember at least well, for me in, in most way more ways than one yeah all right well, well thank you for listening everybody and i guess we'll catch you next time mm-hmm. yep <laughs> goodbye <laughs> All right. How how much more apathetic can we be about this? <laughs> I had a mouthful of burners. I'm like, I don't want to spit all over my microphone. <laughs> oh, man. All right, guys. Have a great woodworking week, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye-bye. Oh, that was great. We're just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you around. Guess Thanks if, for coming in on a Monday. Guess if I have to. I was worried that, that Samantha was going to say, like, she's walked into the ocean several times, and we've pulled her back. <laughs> Boy, this is getting, it was getting a little creepy. <laughs> no, that was cool. Very nice to hear from uh, from a lady.